Welcome to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. Now, the big issue as we approach the low point of the summer doldrums, usually associated with August 15th, is the question of Allen, the ISIS czar in the State Department, an appointee of Skull and Bones Kerry, brought in to engineer a situation where the U.S. would have no choice but to attack Assad. And that is a very dangerous game, which we reject. We say the alternative in Syria is Assad or chaos. And that makes Assad far and away the superior choice. So people that are trying to repeat the Libyan operation of chaos, delirium, and the end of civilization, they're trying to bring that to Syria. And remember, Damascus is probably the oldest inhabited place in the world, in the world. Uh, that's, and that's going some. Uh, it's also the birthplace of Christianity, St. Paul on the Damascus Road. That's where uh, an organized church, in the sense that we've seen it, originated. So all sorts of reasons to be on the side of Assad. It's also the last pluralistic, ethnically pluralistic, religiously pluralistic, secular government with class-based Nasserist principles. Much to recommend it. Far better than the butchers of ISIS. And we're finding out now about the rape culture of ISIS. Why don't we get a, uh, a mobilization of feminists on that? And I'm afraid that when you get something that horrendous, uh, there are no limits. Um, so it's got to be shut down. We're looking at Allen, as you know, uh, the Tax Wall Street Party, the United Front Against Austerity, the morning briefing that you can see on Tarpley.net, and I myself personally, are engaged in a campaign to get Allen out. We want to educate pop publics. We want to educate opinion leaders around the world in this question of Allen. Why Allen must be fired. Hashtag fire Allen for ISIS and do it now. We can easily spin out a scenario that gets you to World War III very, very quickly. Uh, we have been, um, we, we've enjoyed the cooperation in this uh, of an eminent website that is the Voltaire Network of Thierry Maison. We had him on two weeks ago. Uh, let's see what we can do this week and in the coming weeks to, uh, to make sure that people in this country are aware of that uh, source and, uh, and uh, join in to this anti-Allen campaign. Now, the big news of this past week is that we have had the first sign of institutional resistance uh, in the uh, United States against the machinations of the Alan Petraeus seditious insubordinate clique, people who are trying to impose policies that the American people don't want and even that Obama doesn't want. The White House doesn't want it, and, uh, and Allen is doing it all the same. Why isn't he fired? Certainly, if you fire Allen at this point, you're going to torpedo the Iran nuclear accord. That is one of the things Allen wants. He's essentially saying, come on, hit me, uh, because if you hit him, then he can then, uh, if he's fired and out of the government, he can then... Uh, go ahead and say, well, now I'll tell you all about the terrible Iranians. So this would be a terrible uh, disadvantage for the month of September when it's going to be important to, uh, to get this Iran nuclear accord approved, right, in the face of the neocons and in the face of little Rand Paul, who has unmasked as a warmonger on this issue, as everybody uh, can see, right, chasing that reactionary Republican base. So we want Allen out. Actually, the, uh, uh, the, the slogan could also be indict Allen, fire him first and then indict him. But that, even that wouldn't stop him from talking. But the idea would be make him an offer he can't refuse, shut him down, uh, prevent him 
from doing the two things he wants. He wants to torpedo the Iran nuclear deal, and he wants to get the U.S. involved in the war in Syria. So now, the institutional uh, pushback and resistance, where does it come from? This is a very important article. I recommend it. I've plastered this all over my website, all over my Twitter. You've got to be aware of this. It comes from Fox News. Now, Nervous Nellies, don't worry, you're not going to be tainted by contact with Fox News on this one. This is simply the vehicle that a group of people in the Pentagon have chosen to leak out how horrified they are about what Allen is doing and hopefully uh, stimulate some counterpunch against this uh, Allen Petraeus clique. So we're talking Fox News. We're talking the 10th of August. And we're recording here on the afternoon of the 14th. So earlier this week, uh, the article written by their uh, correspondent, Jennifer Griffin, national security uh, correspondent for Fox News. And the idea of this is it goes back and reconstructs the horrible situation that emerged on the 24th of July. Remember, Obama has left Washington, he's flying to Kenya, and Allen gets together with Erdogan and says, okay, the boss is out of town, let's have a coup. Let's have a mini putsch in, in the policy realm. Let's do an end run around the president. Sedition, treason. So Allen does it anyway. Uh, and how does it happen? <laughs> the dramatic scene is, we're at something called the Combined Air and Space Operations Center. And here, as we're told on that fateful day, quote, a Turkish officer came into the Combined Air and Space Operations Center and announced that the strike would begin in 10 minutes. The strike means that Turkey is going to bomb not ISIS, as they had promised, but the Kurds. In other words, the main force that the U.S. is relying on uh, and indeed, the front line of civilization in general. The Kurds are the front line of human civilization against the ISIS butchers, rapists, mass killers, genocidalists, lunatics, and all the rest. So the Turkish officer comes into the Combined Air and Space Operations Center in a secret location. I mean, they know where it is, but we, for us, it's secret. Uh, the strike will begin in 10 minutes. So he says... All allied jets, U.S., British, French, doesn't matter. Go to the south of Mosul immediately or you could be in big trouble. And the officer telling this story, the military source with knowledge of the Turkish attack says, quote, we were outraged, outraged. And America, you better be outraged, too. This is horrendous. This is out of the question. So they're telling the U.S. Naval and Air Force pilots to skedaddle, and it's not only them. Even more serious, perhaps, the U.S. Special Forces are training the Kurds, doing something good for a change, right? Gold is where you find it. Don't close your mind. Remember, this is the front line against civilization. So if the U.S. can help the Kurds, great, do it. So uh, at the time that these bombs begin to fall, right, the Turks are starting to bomb the PKK Kurds. At least officially, the U.S. doesn't have anybody there. But the YPG Kurds in Syria, the U.S. has large commitments of advisors, helpers, and, uh, and, and it should be more. It should be, these are the people you want to help uh, militarily, arm them, right, because they're fighting your battle. So the quote here is, we had no idea who the Turkish fighters were, airplanes now, their call signs, what frequencies they were using, their altitude, or what they were squawking to identify the jets on radar. Now, the uh, thesis of the article is that we're headed towards a wider war, thanks to Allen. So fire Allen for ISIS, and we'll be back in a minute. Video, it's the afternoon of August 14th, and you're going to hear this on... August 15th, so migliori auguri per il Ferragosto, right? This holiday goes back to the Emperor Augustus Caesar. So it's a long-standing holiday. Uh, great day to relax uh, and get busy on social media attacking Alan. You can do that uh, in your your chaise long, right? On your deck chair, you can uh, put out the stuff to make sure that Alan gets fired. So. 
the uh, question is, when the Turkish bombing starts, the U.S. aviation gets 10-minute warning, and the other allies, right, where they are, lots of people, right, Jordan, other, other countries, Iraq, right, all of them are told, get out of the way, the Turkish Air Force is coming with U.S. F-16s, how about that? And there's a danger that the U.S. special forces who are training the Kurds to fight ISIS, to fight them more effectively, to defend civilization in the first rank, they are almost getting killed by the Turkish bombs. Turkish treachery has gone too far. The insanity of Erdogan and Dabu Tolyu, this has gone too far. Enough already. Obama had threatened on the 22nd of July, we believe, to kick Erdogan out of NATO if he didn't stop supporting ISIS. And again, it's more than supporting. He's the head of ISIS. He's the caliph. He's the military commander of ISIS. He wants to move them east. It's true. He wants to knock off northern Iraq as much as it needs to be knocked off. But above all, then Iran and the Caucasus, Transcaucasus or and or other areas, right? This is supposed to be uh, Tamer Lane, the great, <laughs> or the not so great in this case, and they're supposed to uh, do the job. Now, the dangers, uh, as soon as the U.S. starts essentially getting perceived within Turkey as supporting a bombing campaign of the PKK, you got some pretty violent Marxist-Leninists in uh, Turkey, in the cities, uh, and lo and behold, they start attacking U.S. Uh, diplomatic facilities, right? That happened on Monday of this week. The second step, though, and I think this is the one of the things that it, it's implicit in this article, but we can be much more uh, uh, explicit. If Turkey succeeds in weakening the Kurds, in particular, if Turkey succeeds in weakening the YPG Kurds, those gallant, courageous fighters who destroyed ISIS in the city of Kobane, right, who broke the myth of ISIS invincibility, which the Anglo-American media had so assiduously cultivated, right? They showed that ISIS was not 10 feet tall, that you could crush them, defeat them, humiliate them, drive them out, smash them. Those Kurds are now getting bombed. Now, if the Kurds get bombed, YPG, PKK, then who's going to fight ISIS? Well, Turkey won't, and that will be the end of it. it. Quite possibly the Iraqis can't. Remember, the problem with Iraq is that the Iraqi officers are bribed by Saudi Arabia and assorted uh, characters, right, who want ISIS to grow. And, of course, this is done under CIA auspices, too, right? There's a split in the U.S. government on this, right? Allen and his neocons and Petraeus are on one side. But now— if the U.S. allows Turkey to crush the Kurds, there'll be nobody to fight ISIS. ISIS at that point will begin once again to expand. They will go to Beirut. They will go to Baghdad. They will go beyond that. And then we're going to hear the fascist Republican brigade demanding, as we heard in their lunatic debate, U.S. boots on the ground, U.S. ground divisions. And once you get the U.S. ground divisions in there, they will require air support, and then you're on your way to a war with Assad. And there is no reason it can be avoided. This is the uh, tremendous catastrophe which is now looming as a result of Allen's machinations. Again, it's a simple chain. It's a simple chain of cause and effect. Turkey smashes the Kurds with air attacks. Okay, the Kurds are weakened. The only, if the only enemy of ISIS is weakened, ISIS will grow. ISIS grows, the, the uh, hysteria is unleashed when they capture various capitals, again, from Beirut to Amman to, to Baghdad and so forth. And at that point, the pressure for U.S. ground forces will become overwhelming. And this is what Allen wants. This is the goal. This is not a, a, an unwanted byproduct. It's not a spinoff. This is the very main of his intent. So uh, this has to end. And once you get the U.S. at war with Assad, with ground divisions in Syria, you are well on your way to a general war, and you are well on your way to World War III. And this cannot be allowed. This must be nipped in the bud. Right? Um, 
stop it when it's uh, still not yet completely unfolded. So it's clear this uh, Alan Erdogan, the safe haven for terrorist uh, m- m- malarkey of the uh, that weekend of the 24th, 25th, 26th, 27th of July, this opens the gates of hell, right? Just at the time in the, in the Chinese calendar, of course, Yen Lo Wang, the Lord of the Inferno, lets out all the hungry ghosts. Well, this time Yen Lo Wang appears in the guise of General Allen uh, and his friend uh, Erdogan, right? Uh, in some ways, the stupidest of all heads of state that we've seen lately. So, by striking the Kurds, we read in this article, NATO ally Turkey may have opened a new front in the uh, the situation there. And uh, this is a war that could blow back on the U.S. and Turkey. Two women opened fire on the heavily guarded U.S. consulate uh, in, uh, in one of the Turkish uh, cities. And in, in retrospect also here, a senior defense official tells Fox News that another reason the Kurds want to keep the 68-mile border open is to prevent the Kurds from selling their oil uh, on the Mediterranean. In other words, there's a there's a Kurdish corridor all along the southern border of Turkey, all the way over to Syria and uh, the Syrian Mediterranean ports, <laughs> except for the 68-mile gap. And this is exactly what we put out in our map that we put out in the morning briefing on the 27th of uh, July, right, that Monday. So the quote here is, the safe zone was Turkey's way of preventing the Kurds uh, from completely taking over the border, right? They don't want, and we've stressed this, right, they don't want the the Kurds taking over uh, the border. So Turkey doesn't want to eliminate ISIS, right? Turkey does not want to eliminate ISIS. Well, we do. They want to prevent the Kurds from taking over the border. They need U.S. help to do this. Now, it is important. U.S. officials have rejected Turkish requests to set up a safe zone of any sort in the north of Syria. And indeed, we should hold on to the fact that the Obama White House on 27th of July repudiated this idea. They said, no, this is not the U.S. policy. But that doesn't stop Allen and his seditious crew. Back in a minute. Oh, August 14th, 2015 here in Washington and the bureaucratic warfare, the intrigue, the putsch, mini putsch, coup, mini coup, cold coup, creeping coup. The top creep is Allen. Fire Allen. Get rid of the ISIS SAR. Don't let him start World War III. And I've just shown you how that scenario could work. Don't let him weaken the Kurds to the point where the only forces available, in their sense, to fight ISIS become the Marines, right? So he's threatening the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and the Marines. Uh, It's too much. This guy has to go. Obama should carry out with an ultimatum Repeat that ultimatum in public. Erdogan, stop stop your full support of ISIS or out of NATO. And at that point, the Turkish army, I think, would come forward and take care of Erdogan uh, one way or another and put a stop to this, uh, this, this uh, monstrous policy that he has uh, inaugurated, right? Complete lies, deception, uh, and everything else. Um, It's also worth noting, uh, Tom Kiley made this point the other night. I think it's very germane. If you've got Obama saying to Erdogan, look, uh, stop supporting ISIS or we'll kick you out of NATO, 22nd of July. And then more recently, two weeks ago, Putin saying to the Turkish ambassador, stop supporting ISIS or you can go to hell with your uh, president. He can go to hell with his ISIS terrorists. We'll have a nice big Stalingrad for them in northern Syria. Uh, Erdogan is uh, sufficiently isolated. The only thing holding Erdogan up is actually Allen. So you can do all of this very neatly. You don't have to do any of the big bloody stuff, right? The wet work, none of that is needed. You simply say, Allen, you're fired and uh, let him say what he wants. Now, I I can see that Obama is not going to do that until the Iran deal goes through, because that's the substance of the extortion practiced by Allen. But um, 
I think he could also be convinced to uh, to go quietly. In other words, to uh, to cease his uh, activities and shut up about it. Um, right? Maybe his uh, his pension might be in in jeopardy. Right? Certainly, if he if he's convicted of uh, abuse of office. Now, uh, just in terms of that. Uh, ultimatum by Putin to the Turkish government. Uh, some people were skeptical about this. Uh, let me just show you. I, I think it, the the atmosphere in Russian diplomatic circles is, what can we say, heated enough for that thing to be perfectly plausible. And now what we know is that on the 12th of August, we have Sergei Lavrov, consummate diplomat, very intelligent man, uh, We've been, uh, you know, glad to see him in action for many years now. Uh, he started swearing during a news conference, so he's trying to uh, bring the Saudis to a point of reason. And we pointed out that there may even be realists in Saudi Arabia, although this is a controversial thesis. Uh, this is now Adel Al Jubair. We know him here in Washington. He was here for quite a while. So 40 minutes into the joint press conference, while Lavrov's speech is being translated into Arabic, the Russian foreign minister can be heard quietly but distinctively muttering expletive imbeciles, uh, expletive imbeciles. Uh, so uh, you, they can't tell us. The, the Moscow Times cannot tell us the word because of uh, – laws against obscenity over in uh, Russia. Um, some people say no. The spokeswoman for the foreign ministry, Maria Zakharova, says no. Uh, he didn't really say it. All right, fine. They're not going to they're not going to confirm. Yes, he said it. And that's the same thing with the uh, the ultimatum to Turkey. Right? They're not going to confirm it. That's the whole point. These are things that are delivered, uh, but then they're denied. But they're they're denied with non-denial denials. OK, so um, I believe that the the ultimatum from Putin to Turkey is and has been was real. But now we have also these people inside the U.S. Now, there's also some bad feeling in the um, in the U.S. Um, you know, editorial world. I know the, the Washington Post is not so happy with what the uh, Turks are doing. And that's, uh, you know, all of these things do add up, right? Turkey's parallel war, another offensive threatens the fight against the Islamic State. Washington Post, Friday, August 7th, uh, a year ago. And um, the best, they, this is the Washington Post, they say the best response is to urge Erdogan to quickly end the offensive against the PKK and seek a new ceasefire. Davutoglio had written a raving op-ed, I think we quoted part of it, uh, the previous week, that a long-standing peace process was not dead, although Erdogan said it was dead, so now they should uh, resume it. But of course, the problem here in the Washington Post, there's no reference to the mini-coup carried out by Allen, right? There's no, there's no reflection of this intrigue. So remember, uh, the White House denied it. And if you want to read about this here, let me also point out Voltaire Network does yeoman service. Voltaire Network does a very good job. They put Allen's mug on their front page, and it's called Syria, the Rhetoric and the Truth by Thierry Maison uh, from Beirut, Lebanon now, August 13th, 2015. And uh, the idea here is we've got to watch out what Allen is doing. Um, one, uh, we, we got to go back to these vetoes, right? In other words, those vetoes by Russia and China, October 2011, February 2012, July 2012, three vetoes, you cannot bomb Assad. So these are three, uh, three vetoes from two uh, powers. Uh, the um, question then is also geopolitics, right? Russia wants to have a presence in the Mediterranean. They want to have the naval base of Tartus. I've seen it. I've been there, not inside, but at least outside, and you can see it. Um, uh, Turkey, uh, Erdogan, has been scheming for years 
to get the U.S. embroiled. May 2013, Turkey says there was a massive terror attack in Rehani, and they say the Syrians did it. Uh, and remember, the Ghouta uh, chemical weapons fraud of the 21st of August 2013, right? The <laughs> British MI6 unmasked it, warned the U.S., according to Maison. Uh, and there was a cleverly orchestrated debate in the House of Commons. London and Washington left Ankara and Paris to their crimes and their bluster. OK, so does the Obama administration have a strategy uh, to work with Iran and uh, remodel uh, the region? Right. In what sense? But it's, you can certainly see that Obama is not the worst game in town and the stupid uh, libertarians, I guess some of them are, the stupid people who spend their time attacking Obama, um, that, that is counterproductive at this point. Attack Allen. Get rid of Allen. In other words, get rid of the people around Obama that are worse than Obama, who are, wor who are working hard to make Obama worse than he would normally be in this apparatus. Once, you've, once you're done with them, if you want to, you can then go after Obama. That's fine. If, if you can show that Obama is actually the worst center of initiative, in other words, that the Obama policy is the worst. Right now, I say, go after Allen. Fire Allen for ISIS. That's the watchword for the rest of this month. And remember, Obama's out of town. The U.S. government is out of town, right? The Congress, the House, and the Senate are out of town on the long recess, right? They're cavorting at the Iowa State Fair. Obama's on Martha's Vineyard, Supreme Court not here. There's a void, nature abhors a void, and the schemer Allen wants to move into that void. Now we have uh, a very important element of our program today. We're going to be able, if the technical side holds up, to bring you an evaluation from Thierry Maison, I believe in Damascus at this time, once again, we just heard that article where he was datelining from uh, Beirut. So welcome Thierry. We would like you to start, if you could, uh, give us the big picture. That is to say, since the signing of the uh, Iran nuclear accord, what has been going on? How do you read that? Iran nuclear accord. What what are the um, the uh, hidden goals? Okay. Right. What is what's actually going on in terms of secret diplomacy and things like this? Uh, in fact, there is uh, the public agreement between Iran and the five plus one, but at the same time there is a secret agreement, a bilateral one, between Iran and the U.S. And the the main thing is that Iran is no more a revolutionary power uh, fighting against imperialism and for freedom in the Middle East. Right now, the, the new team at power in Tehran is working uh, with, the, with the U.S. as the, uh, the, the same capitalist class from Tehran and from Washington. And they want to uh, restart the old policy of the Shah Reza Pahlavi, who was the, the gendarme of the Middle East for the U.S. So, of course, this is a, a complete change since 35 years. And uh, the first result is that uh, um, this means the end of the war between the Shias and the Sunnis. You know that uh, 35 years ago, when uh, uh, Imam Khomeini organized this big revolution against the U.S. and the British in his own country, uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, uh, his uh, advisor, um, Brzezinski, they decide to... Um, uh, ask for the, to ask the Saudis to fight against the, this Islamic revolution. So they, uh, since that very moment, begins, uh, began the opposition between Sunnis from 
from Saudi Arabia, and she has from uh, from Iran. But uh, before, never such uh, a fight occurred. It was never like now. And uh, uh, one month ago, the, the Saudis said they were the, the leader of the, all the Sunnis in the world when the, the, the Iranians said they were the leaders of the Shia. But this is finished. But right now, as there is always an opposition between Saudis and Iranians, the Saudis say they are the leaders of the Arab world, not the Sunnis, but the Arab world. When the Shias, when the, the Iranians say they are no more the leaders of the, of the Shias, but of the Persians. So you, you find now a new opposition between the two powers. And of course, in all this region, uh, the, the people need to, to choose their new camp. Uh, right now, Iran is supporting Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon against uh, uh, the Israelis, and also the resistance in Palestine. But this could change in the, in the next month, or, or, or this could evolve. The second point is that uh, um, as Iran is now working with the U.S., we can uh, imagine that in the in next month you will have new problems between Iran and Russia. Because right now, the main focus of the U.S. is to confront Russia. So that's why you are now seeing in the Middle East the uh, new coalition against uh, the Islamists, uh, the Daesh and Al-Qaeda and all the jihadists. And uh, Turkey is organizing the jihadists against Russia. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a big uh, conference organized by the Turkish government and the Ukrainian government. And together, they create uh, an, Isl an international Islamist brigade against Russia. And they began to, to send jihadists from Daesh to Ukraine to confront Russia in Crimea. So uh, probably in the next year, you will see the peace in the Middle East, but the war in the Black Sea, in Turkey, mm -hmm and Ukraine, in Crimea. So that's a, a huge uh, change in uh, all that part of the world. That's, uh, that's fascinating. We're going to have to uh, look at that carefully. Uh, obviously, war, moving the war to the Black Sea is not progress, because um, in many ways, the... Um, the strategic dangers, in other words, the flashpoints in on the northern coast of the Black Sea are more dangerous because they're they're nuclear. Um, you can e easily get a nuclear war out of Ukraine, but not so much in the Middle East. So this is actually very threatening. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, this is only um, a, a, a way for the U.S. Um, to confront directly the, the Russians. That's why they realized this, uh, this peace with Iran. Um, there was no uh, nuclear deal at all, because you, as you know, and President Obama recognized this uh, right uh, now, uh, there, there was no military nuclear program in Iran since the end of the Iraq war in uh, uh, the Iran-Iraq war ended in uh, 1908. So since that time, there is no more uh, military uh, nuclear program in Iran. The only reason of all this change is for U.S. to confront China, to, to confront Russia, and after that, China. But uh, um, by some aspects, it's, uh, it's better, because it means also that the U.S., are uh, changing their strategy. They are no more 
uh, supporting the Torsian strategy of the chaos. And they are now um, uh, using the old strategy of the Cold War with states against states. And for the people, it's really better than the chaos. All right. Now, I, I've seen in uh, articles you've written that you put Cuba together with Iran as part of a same U.S. strategy of trying to remove possible friends of uh, Russia, China. Yes, but uh, I don't think they want to change the policy of Cuba, and Cuba is a very small state, uh, not at all like Iran. Cuba has no means to, to fight against uh, 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 the U.S. imperialism, but uh, um, by um, um, changing the relation with Cuba, the U.S. are expecting to change the relation with other countries in Latin America, and especially with, uh, with Venezuela. Uh, right now, there is a, a big, uh, uh, big force from the U.S. Hang on one second. We have this automatic uh, station break. Yes, we'll be yes. right back with Thierry Maison from Damascus. This is now our uh, second hour, and we're still talking with Thierry Maison, one of the most important thinkers about world affairs in our time. He's uh, in Damascus, and Thierry was just commenting on the U.S. rapprochement with uh, Iran, uh, consequences of that, good and bad, uh, and then with Cuba, and Thierry was saying that um, the idea here is that the rapprochement between U.S. and Cuba could um, what have uh, implications for Latin America as a whole? Jerry, maybe you could pick it up there. Um, so, uh, first, I think that uh, um, this rapprochement between Iran and the U.S. Um, will um, will create uh, a peace in the Middle East. First, we will have peace in Yemen, and uh, of course, it will be presented in the media as a victory for Saudi Arabia. And after that, we will have the peace in Syria, and it will be presented in the media as a victory for Iran. Of course, that's not the truth, but uh, it's the way to, to, to solve these things. And uh, yeah. uh, after that, um, we will have a the coalition government in Syria, and it will be very difficult to to find this coalition government because the, the Iranians want to impose inside this government some member of the Muslim Brotherhood, which are supported by the U.S. And of course, if the Syrians make a war during five years, it's not to... Uh, uh, help the Muslim Brotherhood to enter in their own government. But uh, we will see how uh, this will evolve. But the, when, when the, the peace will be in, uh, in Yemen and, uh, and Syria, the main problem will be in Turkey. Because, as I said previously, the war will shift from the Middle East to the, the Black Sea. And in Turkey now, there is a very chaotic situation between, because uh, President Erdogan decided to attack his own Kurdish minority, saying they are uh, terrorists. Of course, uh, they are not, but uh, that's uh, the way they, they deal with, their, with that minority. And you know that Turkey is uh, a very special um, country because since one year, since the uh, one century, since the end of the um, Ottoman Empire, they have not solved the problems of that empire. Since one century, they continue to have a bad relations with uh, all their neighbors, and they continue to deny the genocide of the Armenians and the the, the the Greek Christians. So that uh, that country, Turkey, need a, a, a profound 
modernization and a way to uh, to help uh, modern people and very old society to live together. But unfortunately, uh, President Erdogan decides to begin in a new civil war inside this country to be sure that the, the main part of the society will support him against the, the Kurdish people. Of course, he is uh, thinking at the civil war in the 90s, but now the situation is very different. And if a civil war began in, uh, in Turkey, it will not be only between the, the Sunnis and the Kurdish people. It will be something uh, uh, much more complicated with uh, the Arabs, with uh, the different political parties. Uh, mm. with, it, it will be a, a total disaggregation of the society. Uh, so, President Erdogan thinks that uh, with the help of NATO, uh, he could uh, stay at power. That's why suddenly he cut all the, the connection with Russia. You know that uh, eight months ago, he made a, a special agreement with Russia to build a gasoduct from Russia through Turkey to Europe to be sure to, um, uh, to, to, to send the, the Russian gas to, to Europe despite the embargo decided by the European Union and the U.S. Right, this uh, was the Turkish stream gas yes. pipeline, right? Going, going yes, in, then uh, into the Balkans, maybe going into Greece. Yes, but uh, two weeks ago, he decided to stop this uh, Turkish stream. At the same time, when he made this agreement with General Allen um, to uh, bomb the, the Kurdish uh, minority and to create uh, uh, a buffer zone with Daesh against Syria. But as you said, uh, this was... Uh, uh, this, this was... Uh, forbidden by President Obama, and uh, right, right now there is a, um, a, a, a total chaos on, uh, on the Syrian-Turkish border, because they decide to close this border, but in fact, already the Turkish army is supporting the jihadists inside Syria and inside Iraq. The Turkish NATO army is supporting terrorists in Syria and Iraq. Yes, it's very clear that now uh, President Erdogan is the real enemy of Daesh, the, the real uh, commander-in-chief of the jihadists, both in Syria and in Iraq. And uh, um, as uh, I explained previously, uh, uh, President Erdogan, with uh, the Ukrainian state, decided to create a, a new international Islamist brigade to attack Crimea, to attack Russia. So he will use the people from Daesh for that purpose. So, uh, President Obama asked to diminish, to, to degrade uh, Daesh, but not to destroy it, of course. So the, such uh, private army is uh, a marvelous tool of the U.S. against other states. A CIA secret army, to be sure. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Well then, we got a couple of more minutes. Anything else to add? Um, I don't know. <laughs> let's see. Um, know. So let's just go back. A coalition government in Syria. Yes. So this coalition government, um, uh, we know that uh, there is a, a plan for the, the main uh, big powers decided at the United Nations and uh, the special envoy of uh, Ban Ki-moon, Mr. Stefan Denis Ruta, explained uh, uh, one week ago at the Security Council that he will begin.
again new uh, talks between uh, Syrian factions, and when he will uh, have some uh, results, he will uh, present the result to a contact group. Of course, it means that uh, all these talks will be uh, under the control of the main powers, uh, the U.S., uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran. Okay. Terry, we want to thank you. That's a, that's a tremendous briefing. That's uh, food for thought for several weeks, I'm sure. Uh, we've run out of time. Maybe we get back in touch with you in a couple of weeks and see how this is all going along. Okay. And in the meantime, okay. best of luck to you and to everybody at the Voltaire Network <laughs> for performing an important public service. Bye-bye, and we'll see you next week, and we'll be back in just a minute on World Crisis Radio. It's August 14th, Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now, um, sadly, uh, six months after Syriza came into power in Greece, more or less, um, we have to register a an interim setback uh, in the form of this third uh, bailout, which is uh, an unfortunate result. Uh, however, life goes on and you got to learn the lessons the Greeks do, the Europeans do, and everybody does. And that's our commitment, right, that we will uh, look at this without fear or favor. So uh, I'll be I'll be expatiating on that. But let's go to let's go to Athens now and talk to our friend Michael Chiotinas, who can give us some idea of, of what it looks like on the ground. And again, where uh, Greek politics may be headed in the coming weeks and months. Michael, welcome. Hello. Yes, of course. This uh, the things things are exactly as you said. Um, this the third memorandum, the third uh, bailout deal was passed through Parliament yesterday with with the help of the opposition. Out of um, of course, it's going to be a terrible deal. We we shouldn't really get into it. It has no meaning. Uh, the thing is. Out of 149 Syriza MPs, 118 voted yes, while 31 voted no or abstained. Uh, Tsipras has declared that the limit <laughs> he was going to uh, have was 120, and if he got less, then he would go for a vote of confidence in parliament. So we can expect Tsipras uh, to ask for the parliament's vote of confidence as he took less than 120, um, which he may yet receive, let me tell you. Now, Syriza's internal opposition, the left platform, says they don't want to bring down the government. They want to make the government change course. Uh, I... But, but but whether or not he receives the vote of confidence, at least it seems very likely that we're going to have elections in September or October. Uh, this will probably be an open rupture with the left platform because, of course, he's not going to include them in the ballot, you know. And um, Tsipras will probably win the election again. But the interesting thing will be to see how much of the vote can be gained by the new, by some some new Euro exit party, which will probably be formed by Syriza dissidents. In this case, okay. in the case of an election. Now, unless of course Syriza itself indeed finds a way to change course, because truth is, I don't know for how long can the party enjoy this um, grace period with society. You see. Uh, honeymoons don't last forever, especially especially when people start feeling the pain of the new measures. <laughs> when the money runs out. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, uh, you know, uh, the people start getting uh, feeling the pain. So there is and will be political instability in Greece. And things are going to get worse. Uh, phenomena we now observe... Uh, like, for example, the parliament speaker opposing the government and making very harsh points during her speech in parliament. These things we haven't seen before. They are mm -hmm. unprecedented. 
So my point is this, to sum up, we're probably going to see a vote of confidence inside August and maybe elections in the coming months. While the economic situation keeps getting worse, of course, and um, we will have some turbulent times ahead of us. Let me ask you something a little bit off our usual uh, analytical path. Now, uh, uh, am I right that Greece has made some kind of a defensive accord with Israel uh, in the past couple of days? Yes, yes. We don't know specifics, but we can look into it. Uh, this is a very strategic, uh, strategically important um, because uh, deal because it's it has to do with Turkey and all this and you know, the the disputes over the Aegean Sea. So uh, Cyprus comes in to this. Um, we'll see about how this goes on. But Israel is a is a, a strategic. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's a counterweight, counterweight to Turkey, in effect, yes. right? The great fear of Turkey, and of course the fact that we've got Erdogan, who is a certified madman. Yes. And uh, and there's a great desire not to be, you know, a weak uh, prey in his uh, path. But then, of course, the problem with the, the you know the close relations with Israel will create new problems, unfortunately. Maybe uh, we're going to have to see how close they are because we we really don't know. All right. Now the other one is there's a lot of attention here on the refugee crisis and how a bunch of refugees were were uh, camped overnight in a stadium without proper logistics. Any any news on that? Uh, who's <laughs> responsible? Or obviously Schäuble is responsible, but anything of more course. on that? Of course, of course. The main thing here to, to recognize is the inability of Europe itself to solve a, a quite basic problem, uh, like a humanitarian crisis uh, from, refu from refugee flows. This is this is an affront, I'm afraid, for for Europe itself, for the European Union. What is what does the European Union stand for anyway? If, uh, it, seems, if, it seems to stand for debt, debt collection, but no humanitarian expenditures, and um, and unfortunately, the chauvinism, right, that everybody seems to be infected with, right, that you're not going to lift a finger for uh, refugees. Those refugees could easily rep represent economic value if you look at it right. The, yes. the whole U.S. is built on this proposition, right, that people are wealth. Absolutely, absolutely, and if you look, especially Syrians which are highly educated, very civilized people, and uh, this is a very high quality uh, population, the Syrian population. With people who come here with, <laughs> you know, they're camping outside, they don't have medicine and, they, and uh, food, and they have their iPads, you know, with them, because they, uh, people, they, they are lawyers and uh, doctors and highly, uh, people of high quality. Not just, uh, you know. All right. So uh, so we're looking forward now to this um, vote of uh, confidence. I must say we saw uh, Lapazanis, Lapazanis on the on the French television here. And, uh, well, we'll have to follow it. I'm sorry, yes. Michael, we're out of time. The hard break is signaled by the music. Um, get some rest and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. See you next week. Bye-bye. Back to World Crisis Radio, August 14th, 2015. Now, just in terms of the lessons, a couple of preliminary lessons for Greece. Uh, these are sort of, this is like an emergency synthesis uh, for people who are actually uh, planning to challenge the worldwide rule of finance capital. The first thing is organize internationally. One Greece against 18 Euro member countries, that's a loser. One Greece against 29 European Union members, that's another loser. That's out of the question. So whether you like it or not, you got to knuckle under and realize that you need a broad international front of parties, of unions, and then of countries. Uh, Greece uh, may look bad at this moment, right, August 14th. But remember, Spain is coming somehow, Portugal is coming, Donetsk is uh, still ongoing. 
So uh, there will be much more to be said about this international conflict with austerity. And naturally, the tax Wall Street Party says, in effect, we know the lesson about organizing internationally, right? We mounted a campaign in Great Britain earlier this year. We want to do this in other places. If you find yourself isolated anywhere, including Greece, emphatically, come forward, contact us, go to tarpley.net, send me something on the contact feature. We're looking for activists. We're looking for candidates around the world. Keep in touch with us. Subscribe to our morning briefing. It's free. It's vital. It will give you a much better line on what's going on in the world. The other thing is have an actual coherent program. It's got to be coherent and organic. In other words, it's got to actually be something you can put into effect and get an economic recovery, not a laundry list of the different groups you're trying to pander to. At least uh, it shouldn't be primarily made up of that. The other question is, be ready technically. When um, Varoufakis said he never got from the five uh, advisors that he was working with to the thousand functionaries, bureaucrats, and technicians that he needed. Well, you've got to somehow train these people in secret, right? swear them to secrecy, uh, and get to work. You've got to, you're going to have to print some drachmas, and I'd be interested whether uh, the left platform in Greece has understood. You've got to start printing some uh, drachmas. Uh, you want to have a highly disciplined party. You can see that uh, if you want to have a revolutionary combat party, you can't have people who are popping off as uh, critics. Uh, it's always easy to snipe. It's always easy to get more <clears throat> gate receipts if you're willing to be critical. So those are some of the things. Now, just a, a couple of other uh, items, right? Well, some of them growing out of Thierry Maison's talk. <clears throat> we have this interesting question. <clears throat> the think tank European Leadership Network. I don't know where they get that, but uh, the European Leadership Network has put out uh, a much discussed study. I think they know the rule of August 15th, right? You got to put something out because the, uh, the news files are uh, m much less uh, full than they would be at any other time of the world, of the year. So the European Leadership Network says that. Uh, the fact that we've got intensified military exercises by Russia and NATO, and these are fueling tensions in Europe that have already been heightened by Ukraine. So Russia and NATO call their drills defensive, but each one regards the other's actions as provocative and deliberate aggravation. So summing up, uh, the European Leadership Network says, we don't suggest that the leadership of either side has made a decision to go to war or that a military conflict between the two is inevitable. But the change profile of the exercises is a fact. Now, in some ways, this is plausible. But in other uh, areas, this is, uh, this is absurd. In other words, in particular, Russian intentions, it seems to me, are they've been defensive. They've been modest and defensive during the whole time. Uh, NATO, no. NATO, again, uh, encouraging the hotheads in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, right? The, again, as we always call them, the ones who are willing to fight to the last American, okay? Uh, this, this is not uh, acceptable. Uh, on uh, August 12th, uh, in response to the European Leadership Network report, NATO uh, said that uh, that. It is only responding to growing Russian aggression. Well, how is it growing? Uh, all of this stuff was basically wrapped up by the middle of last year. Uh, the warning came from the ELN and the response from NATO spokeswoman Carmen Romero says NATO military exercises are not, as the report suggests, making war in Europe more likely. They are intended precisely to have the opposite effect, to enhance security and stability in Europe in response to growing Russian aggression. I think that's irresponsible. 
as of August 2015, there is no growing Russian aggression, right? There is, if you want, a frozen conflict. This is not the same. And then she says, all NATO military activities are proportionate, defensive, and fully in line with our uh, commitments. Anyway, you decide for yourself. The ELN report is called Preparing for the Worst, Are Russia, Russian and NATO military exercises making war in Europe more likely. So uh, Russian 80,000 uh, deployed to the uh, the border there in March. NATO's Allied Shield, 15,000 uh, personnel. Um, and we want these drills called off because, as we tried to point out about a year ago, the shooting down or the downing of the Malaysian uh, air, airliner MH17, uh, this was somehow impinging on the realm of one of these sea breeze operations from NATO in the uh, uh, Black Sea. All right. So let us continue having said a few words about Greece, and we'll have more to say. Let's talk about the Chinese uh, devaluation, because this is now an interesting and new uh, aspect. Um, the Chinese devaluation. Where does this uh, where does this leave us? Naturally, devaluations uh, are a form of uh, ultimately economic uh, warfare, and this has been a very sharp Chinese devaluation uh, this week. Um, the currency, the Chinese people's dollar, renminbi, yuan fell by 3.5% against the U.S. dollar in two days. It fell 4.8% in global markets. Um, and ultimately, it gets to be uh, almost uh, a 10% devaluation in, uh, in a couple of weeks. Now, this comes after the collapse of the Chinese stock market bubble. So what's going on? Uh, let's just talk about competitive devaluations, right? The idea being that if you have your currency cheapened, right, if it's uh, less, right, compared to the dollar or the euro, then you can export more easily because you can undercut the comp competition. You get a price uh, competition. Now, is there a danger of a global currency war? Reuters asks this, uh, this question. Uh, and I would say, yes, there is such a danger. And let's look at what's what's going on. Uh, attempting to look inside China without uh, too many illusions about it. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Final segment. Let's talk about uh, about China. Now, here's the uh, the question. This is a competitive uh, devaluation. It, the Chinese are not alone in having done this, right? To be sure, uh, the competitive devaluations uh, have involved, above all, the Japanese yen under Abe, right? All kinds of ways to drive down the price of the Japanese yen. Generally speaking, we've also had a period of great currency instability. In the second half of last year, we had the sharp decline of the Russian ruble as a result of oil prices, as a result of NATO sanctions, and a general desire to beat up on the Russian ruble. But we also had, at the beginning of the year, the sharp upvaluation of the Swiss franc when they decided that it was not worth defending a peg against the euro. They, went, they allowed the uh, Swiss franc to go way up, so much so that when you uh, pass through Geneva uh, this year, as I did, coming back from Russia, you find that the, the, uh, the airline there is pleading for your, uh, your understanding, right, that they, they didn't want to raise prices and they're going to try to get them down, but they're operating uh, on an accounting system based on Swiss francs, right? And uh, Geneva seemed uh, pretty uh, empty at the time. So all of this stuff going on, um, what you've got to remember is go back to Great Britain September 1931, 
The prime minister was Ramsey MacDonald. He was the right wing, extreme right wing Labour Party prime minister. And he pioneered the policy of dealing with the depression. Right By 1931, the world was in a depression. Ramsey MacDonald said, we will carry out currency devaluations, competitive devaluations among currency blocks, in this case, the pound block. And we will have a beggar my neighbor policy of cutthroat competition. This is uh, unfortunately what the, uh, the Chinese government is doing. Now, why do they do it? The Chinese government has severe problems of legitimacy. They're not elected. Who chose them? Why them? Uh, and the only answer they have to that, and it's not a bad answer if you can keep it going, is we deliver the goods, you dynamic, you demonic legitimation. We deliver rising standards of living. We deliver a better life. But the problem with that is what happens if you can't deliver? Right? What happens if the eudaimonic legitimation breaks down? Well, then, you've got a problem. Uh, when you have an illegitimate government, and the Chinese Communist Party, I'm afraid, is of that type, uh, kind, if, if the living standard begins to fall, you're in big trouble. Now, what, what happened? Uh, the Xi government, the new uh, head of the uh, Chinese uh, regime, uh, has been attempting to consolidate power, right? They have a lot of corruption scandals, and the corrupt ones always turn out to be the other factions, right? Not the Xi faction, but the rivals of the Xi faction, they're getting hit with corruption charges. Um, you can see that in the coastal cities of China, there is significant discontent. Now, we saw this Hong Kong umbrella revolution, right? Whatever this was, it was obviously it's a classic uh, Western sponsored color revolution, right? This time with umbrellas. So that's obviously ginned up. But the only time you can gin it up is when there is some vulnerability. Now, the stock market bubble, I think, has uh, shaken the self-confidence of the group around Xi. In other words, their idea was, we know what to do. We can control the economy. We have just lifted 500 million people out of poverty. And this is a tremendous achievement, no doubt about it. But uh, what have you done for me lately is always the question, right? Uh, you got to eat three times a day. Uh, the fact that they fed you yesterday is not going to be enough. So the Xi group thought they had everything under control. And then they get the stock market bubble. And they've now moved in with their classic methods, uh, telling everybody to buy stock and so forth to prop up the bubble. But this is not a solution. And there's, a, I think, a, a, a significant amount of discontent, which is spreading. I, I, I myself have seen how certain populations re re react when the, stock, when, they, when the stock market has been going up, 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 and then it starts to go down. I was in Taiwan in 1987, 1988, and the stock market there, the Taiex, began to go down, and there were riots. People saying, how dare you? It's got to go up. Government intervene to make it go up. Well, unfortunately, this wonderful world uh, of the market doesn't work that way. So if you wanted it to go up, uh, there's no way to do that. Right? So don't don't sell your soul to the uh, to the stock market. Now, um, the funny thing about this is, though, uh, that so that the Chinese government is extraordinarily sensitive. They want to do everything they can to keep the living standard up, to keep it rising. This is understandable. But then in a depression, uh, it's probably more like a 5% uh, devaluation. But in one, one or two weeks, that's huge internationally. Uh, there may be more coming. They, the target may be 10% was what I meant to say. Uh, that's going to get the backup of others, right? Japan won't be happy with that. I don't know if the Eurogarchs uh, are brain dead, but uh, they may be unhappy. And the U.S. has plenty of reason to be unhappy. You saw Trump popping off, and that's unfortunately not something Trump thought up on his own, right? He read that in some financial newspaper. Um, here's now the problem. We have all kinds of people who are now scurrying to act as 
apologists for the Chinese government. How about Pepe Escobar? How about this guy? Uh, his argument is pretty much um, <clears throat> China is acting like an economic imperialist, uh, but when they do it, it's OK. Here's what he writes. When the U.S. embarks on perennial quantitative easing, that's OK. When the EU does QE as well, that's OK, right, Draghi. But when the Bank of China decides it's in the best interests of the nation to let the yuan go down a bit instead of up, that's Armageddon. This is uh, la mauvaise foi. This is an argument in bad faith, right? He says, oh, there's hysteria all over the West. And he says, ah, it's great. We're going to have more Chinese exports, more Chinese exports. Well, uh, you could understand why... If you were looking at this from Ohio uh, and you were losing your job, you would not be so complacent uh, about it. So I think uh, this analysis from Pepe Escobar is, as usual, extremely superficial. Uh, never a notion of program. The notion of program is August 15th, 1971, all those years ago, Nixon and Kissinger destroyed the most enduring aspect of the New Deal of Franklin D. Roosevelt worldwide, which was the fixed parity system of Bretton Woods, the Bretton Woods Economic Accord of uh, Financial Accord of 1944. Since then, we've had the chaos of floating rates. The obvious need to uh, allow the legitimate needs of China, but also of others to be met is to a world monetary conference where a situation of fixed parities could be reestablished. That would also solve the problem that the euro is trying to address, right? The euro comes into existence as a means of avoiding this endless up and down, up and down currency risk. We want to eliminate currency risk from the system. Currency risk is what the finance oligarchs point to when you say, why do you need all those derivatives? They say, well, the system is very risky. Make the system less risky. So get a new Bretton Woods and you will be on your way. We'll have more comments about the problems in China next week on World Crisis Radio. 